Welcome, everyone. If you, mind, if you don't mind get, finding your seats, uh, we'll get this started. I'm Robert Woodrow. I'm currently the head of the math, department, math and stats department here at the University of Calgary. And it's my pleasure to be asked to be the master of ceremonies, which gets, means I get to say rude things about various people as I'm introducing them. Uh, the, f <laughs> the first person that, that I would like to, to bring up to say a few words of welcome and a few comments is our Vice President Research, Ed McCauley, who is a, is a biologist, but we let him into the meeting anyway. And, uh, but he does a mathematical end of biology and is, is, a, is a good friend of PIMS and has, has been uh, in, engaged for a long, a long time uh, with, with us here. So, Ed, if you don't mind. It's always scary when Robert is going to introduce you. You never know what's going to happen. <laughs> Ever. Um, I was really, I'm really fortunate. I had a period of concentration through PIMS in mathematical biology with U of A and UBC and stuff. So I really, really uh, am honored to be here. To welcome the Canadian Number Theory Association Conference delegates, welcome. I know you've been having uh, fun in the meetings. I heard that nothing starts on time and everything goes over time, which is actually <laughs> typical for somebody working in number theory. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Um, I'd really like to also welcome the University of Calgary Emeriti professors. There are a number of, of in, people in the room, my, former, my colleagues uh, from mathematics and also from computer science. Welcome to our faculty who are present, our staff, um, and most importantly, our alumni. I notice there are a number of students here that have gone through the mathematics program here that had the pleasure of, of being influenced by Richard Guy um, and the mathematics department. I'm really pleased and honored to be here today uh, uh, amongst Richard Guy's many friends and colleagues to recognize this important and most impressive milestone. Like the University of Calgary, Richard Guy is celebrating a milestone birthday this year, and it's no secret to anybody in the room. In September, he'll be turning 100 years old. This year, the University of Calgary is turning 50 years old. <laughs> How is that, right? Um, and at last week's convocation ceremony, Elizabeth Cannon, for the Convocation for the Faculty of Science, Elizabeth Cannon, the president of the University of Calgary, acknowledged, among, for all of Convocation, Richard Guy's career and his milestone year that is coming up. Um, it was really delightful to see the response of the audience when Richard Guy stood up on the stage and was applauded by the entire young cohort graduating from the Faculty of Science. It was amazing. Richard Guy, as I mentioned, joined the university before it became independent. And this is an anecdote that Robert has shared with me that I'm really, really excited about. It is fitting to honor Dr. Guy's 100th year at the University of Calgary's 50th year because Richard made the motion at our academic council, our general faculties council, which we, people from the math conference will be aware, governs the university. Richard actually made the motion that the University of Calgary be named THE University of Calgary with a capital T. Um, <laughs> And that capital T is very, very important. Thank you, Richard, for making that motion. <laughs> it wasn't defeated, <laughs> so as it, it happens in many academic senates, right? So it was really good. Uh, Richard, as many of you know, was head of department. Um, uh, and during his headship, many of the group of faculty members who built the department and who are now just retiring from the university were recruited. Um, in those early years, Richard's contacts in number theory, graph theory, and game theory helped to put the University of Calgary and the Department of Mathematics on the world stage. Um, by recruiting a rich suite of eminent visitors to the university, and this continues to this day with the high profile speakers he invites to give the Louise and Richard Guy public lecture each September. Um, although Richard retired at the age of 65, the only real change in his activities <laughs> was that he didn't have regular undergraduate teaching to do. He could spend his time mentoring the next generation of mathematicians and really influencing the department in how it evolves. And also to devote his time for the subject that uh, people are attending this conference, unsolved problems in number theory. And everybody here recognizes his books on game theory with John Conway and Elwin Burlkamp, as well as some more than 100 papers that Richard has produced um, and published. And I think a highlight for many people in the room, I met a few of them, is Richard's influence on young mathematicians. And that, I mean, that's a tremendous uh, service that you've provided to people in Calgary who've had the benefit to interact with you. 
I have a little anecdote. When I first was first recruited to the University of Calgary, I won't say when, 1985. Anyway, um, <laughs> I went to my first Faculty of Science Council meetings, which many of you know are really exciting affairs. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting in front of me, to, down below me, on the seat below, was this gray-haired mathematician, gray-haired person who spent his entire time during that Faculty of Council Science meeting working on game theory problems. And as a mathematician, I could recognize that, sorry. Um, <laughs> I guarantee you it was the most productive thing that was carried out at that faculty <laughs> science council meeting. <laughs> and Ken Barker, <laughs> could, the former dean of science, can account for that. Anyway, so um, I really want to highlight uh, Richards and his wife Louise's passion for wilderness, their hiking and cross-country skiing until just before Louise's death. Their contributions were recognized by the Alpine Club of Canada by naming of the hut of the Wapta Glacier after them. He continu Richard continues to thrive and give invited lectures across North America, and his support of the Wilderness Association saw him climb the Calgary Tower at the age of 99, a record. This is an event every year that's held. <laughs> Richard, you're an inspiration to young and old. We really appreciate and help people here to celebrate your 100th birthday. Thank you. Yes, many of us remember Richard. I, I too remember him. Not quite when he first arrived at the university, but I was an undergraduate. And uh, I somehow managed to escape having the infamous uh, geometry course that was part of the first year honors program because I was a chemist for the first year of my existence here. And instead I took it in the second year from uh, one of the eminent number theorists who was, uh, uh, mathematicians who Richard had visiting uh, Mordell. No, not Mordell, but, uh, no, the name will come back to me later. This just happens when you get older. <laughs> the, uh, the, I'd like next to, uh, introduce the speaker who's going to tell us about uh, th some things about Richard. Uh, Hugh Williams was somebody that we stole away from the University of Manitoba to bring in as uh, an i corps chair in cryptography. He built that group and, 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 and we owe in both our computer science and the mathematics department much to his, his efforts at bringing a strength to the University of Calgary. But then he, he sort of became less visible here because at, towards the end of his career, he was seconded to uh, Ottawa as the head of the Tut Institute, which has, has uh, top secret classified work. So he now was referred to by Ed, uh, just when we were t ch chatting just before the uh, talk, as our ghost professor. So it's my pleasure to call on our ghost professor, <laughs> Hugh Williams, <laughs> to give us a few clouded remarks oh, about uh, Richard and Richard's career. A number there. Uh, okay, this is the clicker. Well, there's a lot of you here. Can you hear me? Good. It would be terrible if you couldn't hear me, or maybe a, a blessing. Uh, before I actually give uh, this talk, uh, I would like, of course, to thank the organizers for providing me with this uh, extraordinary experience of being able to talk about uh, a friend and a colleague of over 40 years. Uh, now, also, you must understand that they've given me something of a challenge because I have to talk about 100 years in 50 minutes. <laughs> uh, I'm going to leave some stuff out. How do I do this? I'm going to hit the wrong thing. No one gave me a lecture. <laughs> and I'm, I'm old, so I'm technically incapable. There. Oh, it's those ones. Those oh, OK. Ones side oh, to side. All yeah. right. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I like this picture. I thought I would start the talk off with it, because it really uh, shows uh, Richard and Louise in their favorite place, and that's the mountains. 
They just loved to be in the mountains, and they did an awful lot of climbing. Ed referred to that earlier in, in his remarks. And I also think of it as a nice picture because it shows Richard surrounded by uh, his, his favorite things, Louise, the mountains, and mathematics. And the thing you ask is, well, where's the mathematics? Well, it's in his head. <laughs> Where else could it be? I'll do that a lot. So everybody starts off uh, being an idea in somebody else's mind. And uh, this is Richard's father, uh, William Alexander Charles Guy, known as Wacky. I guess if you have initials that are W-A-C, you're going to be called Wacky. And uh, Wacky, is, as you see in the picture, is in the uniform. Oh, does anybody recognize that uniform? It's an Anzac uniform. He was in the Australian New Zealand Army Corps. And, he, and you wonder, well, if he was, a, if he was a, Brit, a Brit, what was he doing in that uniform? Well, he had gone to the Perth Boys School to do, to do some teaching. That must have been quite a challenge, getting to Perth back in those days. Anyway, he, he, did, he, he did some teaching there. And when the war broke out in 19, and, and it, it broke out in 1914, but I think he ended up in, 19, in April of 1915 uh, being sent to Gallipoli. I don't know how no, much you know about Gallipoli. If you go to Australia, you'll learn a lot about it. But uh, it's, it was a meat grinder. An awful lot of people were killed. It was just terrible. But uh, Richard's father survived. We have evidence of that. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, uh, the, and he went on to, uh, he, he came back to uh, uh, England from uh, well, Australia, I guess, at that time. And he, that was in 1915. And he married uh, Richard's mother. I, I told you I'm going to do that a lot. And this is Richard's mother, Adeline Augusta Tanner, uh, frequently called, referred to as Gus. Now, Gus was a very interesting woman, uh, a woman probably ahead of her own time. She continued to work even after uh, she was married. And in those days, that was unheard of. But she did it anyway. She was a, a woman of her own mind. And even when she was wrong, she would not admit it. Well, we know lots of people like that. Uh, but anyway, the two of them produced. <laughs> the two of them produced Richard on uh, September the uh, 30th of 1916. And uh, he was their only child. So he got spoiled run. <laughs> and uh, I, I have a few stories that I have here that I, I would like to uh, tell you. And uh, it's best if I do this uh, by reading them. I don't want to lose any of the uh, flavor. But uh, Richard so showed signs of precocity quite early in life. And after his first day in kindergarten, uh, three-year-old Richard told his parents, who were very eager to know, how the day had gone. And he said, it was all right, but the teacher doesn't know much. <laughs> she asked me what the shape of the world was and other sorts of things that I thought she should have known. <laughs> well, Richard has lived a long time. So what are Richard's rules for longevity? Well, it's really the first one here. If you ever ask Richard how come he's lived so long, he said, because I chose my parents wisely. <laughs> and uh, he must have. I think your uh, uh, wacky lived to be well into his 90s. And uh, so you got some good genes. And uh, you continue to but, but live on. But I, I also have seen a few things on my own, which I would add to that list. Certainly, partner with someone compatible. Uh, if you don't, that's a sure way of not living very long, uh, <laughs> one way or another. Uh, maintain some physical activity. Don't just become a couch potato. Maintain your curiosity and sense of wonder. That's very important. You lose that, you're beginning to lose it all. 
Keep on working. In other words, exercise your mind. And be around young people. Young people keep you young. You hang around old farts like me. All you're hearing about is bunions and prostate problems and everything. <laughs> it, it, it ages you. So keep around young people and, and you do better. And he, this is something that he has done. Ed already referred to the effect that he has had on, on young people here. It's been quite profound. Let's see if I can get this right. It's a 50%. So here's Richard's, here's Richard's view on aging. I know it's ridiculous. I clearly look like an old man, and I no doubt, no doubt behave like an old man, but I feel like a kid. What a wonderful thing to be able to say. It's education. Aha. Well, he got his uh, uh, bachelor's at uh, Cambridge in 1938. It was a second class honors. He majored in bridge, chess, and snooker, <laughs> but unfortunately none of them were on the curriculum. So he didn't do particularly well. He goofed off. I've seen students do this. We all have if we've been profs. So he realized after having graduated with second class honors that he, he's, it's going to be kind of hard to find a job. Uh, so he went and got a diploma in education at Birmingham, Birmingham University in 1939. And uh, then he was prepared to work. I should say that both of his parents were not overly keen about that because they were school teachers and they knew how little it paid. Uh, he received his master's degree from Cambridge in 1941. Notice that three years passed. That's what had to happen. Three years had to pass. Then you signed a piece of paper and you gave them five guineas and you got your degree. That was how it was done back then. Now, here is a very wonderful event in Richard's life. He married Louise Therrien uh, in December 21st of 1940. And uh, my wife insists that I tell the story of how they met. And clearly it wasn't on an internet dating site. <laughs> so again, I will read from my copious notes. It was through Louise's brother, Michael, that Richard and Louise met. Michael, who was three years younger than Richard, had also gone to Warwick School, the same school that Richard went, the public school. I think it's the third oldest school in England. And uh, so uh, Richard first met Louise. When Michael came to Cambridge, because he was three years behind, so Richard had already been there, and, so, and Michael came to, to take a look at the rooms that he would be occupying. And Louise came with him. So, fine, he met her, but uh, he then met her again at Michael's home in Nottingham. And to quote Richard, I was meeting Michael and I wasn't really bothering much about his sister. We were just interested in mathematics. <laughs> well, it turned out that Louise knew that Richard liked to dance. Yes, a mathematician that liked to dance. It can happen. <laughs> it's not common, but it can happen. And Richard was one of these exceptional people uh, that, that for which this held. And so what she did was she uh, invited him to a dance uh, that was nearby. And uh, Richard went, because he liked to dance, so did Louise. And I guess they had a great time because they kept seeing each other. And I know at one time Richard actually finally got around to actually, uh, how, how can we put this, uh, taking the initiative and invited Louise to go to the Lake District, to the mountains there. Well, I don't know, you've ever been to the mountains in the Lake District? They're not mountains, they're hills. But especially if you see the things that are out over there. But uh, the, it's, a, it's a very nice place, and, and, and both Louise and Richard loved climbing even then. So, and from that point on, uh, things just took their course. So there's wartime service. Notice so they got married during the uh, Second World War, and now we have uh, his uh, wartime service. There you see him, a handsome young man in his flight lieutenant's uniform, and uh, he's trained as a meteorologist. And he was posted to Prestwick in 1941, and then he was posted to Iceland, 42 to 43. Uh, he was posted to Bermuda, 44 to 46. 
And I guess it would be perfectly natural for him to have developed wanderlust after all of that, and he certainly did. Um, one thing, though, that uh, I should mention is that although he tried to get Louise posted along with him, uh, the authorities would have none of it. So he, she was, and he did not uh, see each other uh, all that much. Although, if to, they must have seen each other at least three times. <laughs> So there's the, 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 a pretty family picture there at the, in, in, the, in, the, in the mid 40s. Uh, let me go on. Now I want to talk a bit about Richard's career. Uh, it, from 1939 to 47, he was a mathematics master at Stockport Grammar School. He was always very good at mathematics, so he ended up teaching mathematics. I think that Richard really liked to teach, and it didn't really matter whether they were uh, youngsters or, or older, he just loved to, to do that. He then went off to, uh, uh, but you know, sometimes uh, these things are uh, limiting in your, in your future. So he went off to Goldsmiths College, uh, you probably don't know that, it's associated with, uh, uh, I guess, uh, London University, uh, and at that time it was a teacher training school. So he was there and he was a lecturer in math, but he got, again, this was kind of limiting, and uh, so he uh, looked around and he, he, he sent off his resume to a number of places, and the first one that responded was the uh, University of Malaya in Singapore. Uh, and they said, yeah, you want to come out here? And so off he went. Now, you got to remember that at this time, poor Louise was looking after uh, three small growing children. And she had wanted to nest a little bit. But Richard wanted, well, the wanderlust, right? So he wanted to continue to, uh, to, to go and see new places. And also get a, a better opportunity. This was a, a, a math department. It was a, a somewhat nascent one, but it, was, it had a good potential. And uh, while he was there, he managed to uh, seduce, I guess perhaps that's the right word, Peter Lancaster to go there in uh, 1957 uh, from England. And uh, uh, so there must have been something going on there. And then later on, he met uh, Eric Milner, who was in Singapore for obscure reasons. And uh, he, he, he said, oh, we've got a mathematician here. Let's recruit him. And so he was also recruited into that department. He stayed there for some time until 1962, and I think for the most of the part, he enjoyed being there. But again, I think found it somewhat limiting. And it turned out that there was this uh, advertisement for a professor and head of the mathematics department at the Indian Institute of Technology in New Delhi. And Richard felt really challenged by that. So he decided that he would go and take on that position. Didn't last there too long. He ran up against uh, some problems with his boss. And so he decided, he got a little bit frustrated. Also, Richard puts it this way, it's kind of hard to live in a place where the temperature is higher than your blood temperature. Uh, Singapore was just sort of hung around that, but uh, New Delhi it was, is hot. So what happened was that he was quite frustrated, and he didn't really do very much, except that uh, his wife contacted Peter Lancaster's wife and said, Richard's not happy. And uh, what happened was that uh, Richard uh, uh, was invited to come to the University of Calgary, which is where Peter Lancaster was at that time. And that was how he got there. And then Eric Milner followed you a little bit later. So at the very beginning of the department, there were three stellar people. Not bad. So he was, as, as Ed has pointed out, professor of mathematics from 65 to 82. Now that 65, it might stri strike you as a little strange. How could he be uh, from 65 when it's only the, the university is 50 years old? But it, it's 
it was something else before that. It was the University of Alberta uh, Calgary campus. And uh, so he, he came at that point, but, uh, and he never really planned to stay much more than a year. So th they, they lived in, in Peter Lancaster's house because Peter was off on sabbatical. And then Peter came back and he had to find another place, which he did, and then finally after two years they decided, I guess we'll stay. And uh, so the wanderlust was over. And uh, he was, uh, he did just about everything. And uh, he became uh, emeritus pro professor in 82, and he became a faculty professor in 95. So here are some pictures. I have a bunch of pictures, so I like to show them off. Uh, this is Richard at Goldsmiths, uh, and the other picture is Richard and Louise in, now, is that Bow Valley Park? It looks a bit like it, but I, 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 it's, it's very hard to tell. Do you remember where that picture was taken, Richard? Do you remember where that picture was taken? Yes. That was in Kananaskis. Okay. I couldn't really tell. It looked a bit like Bow Valley, but it was, which is not that far away. Now, what about Richard's contributions to his subject? He has more than 300 publications, of which almost 150 are refereed. For those of you who are not academics, a refereed paper is the gold standard. Uh, you, that's what promotion, tenure, everything is based on. Refereed papers, papers that are looked at by somebody before they're published. They're in areas like combinatorics, graph theory, geometry, game theory, and number theory. Game theory, I wonder where that came from. Misspent youth? <laughs> As Richard puts it, ma jack of all trades, master of none. Well, perhaps. He supervised five PhD students, nine master's students, and numerous undergraduates. He wrote or co-authored seven books, but I'm going to stick to number theory here because this is the CNTA, so I'm going to just stick to his number theoretic contributions. So he, wrote, he, he did reviews in number theory from 19, uh, the, the 1973 to 83 year. It was a six-volume work. It was a great deal of work because that was really before computers were around to do some of these things. And he wrote Unsolved Problems in Number Theory. Unsolved Problems in Number Theory. This is a really great book, and I'm not being paid by Springer to say so. If you have any interest at all in number theory or mathematics, read this book. It will, it will inspire you. It's really a remarkable piece of work. Now, what does Richard think about all of this? Well, I suppose my small claim to fame arises from the fact that mathematics owes more to those that ask questions than those who answer them. Not that I've asked that many questions, but I've collected them from others, especially Erdős, and then hawked them around. Mike Bennett and Ben Green have both told me that their early inspiration came from unsolved problems of number theory. As we heard earlier today, they were by no means the only ones. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, this is his view. You always have to remember to take what Richard says with something of a grain of salt, perhaps even a boulder. <laughs> so why mathematics? Why did he go into mathematics? Well, Richard says that it's because it was through a process of elimination. He didn't like anything else. <laughs> uh, actually, he, he did like chemistry and physics, but he, he was in, high, very much influenced by a very active and sympathetic and competent mathematics instructor in school, and he was eager to have him study mathematics. And then when he was 17, he purchased a copy of Dixon's History of the Theory of Numbers. Now, this resonates with me because I got a copy of Dixon at about the same age. And he fell under its spell. It is easy to do. Perhaps not so much now, it's a little old-fashioned. But when I saw it, it wasn't so old-fashioned. And when Richard saw it, it certainly wasn't so old-fashioned. <laughs> and the cost of the book at that time was six guineas. That was a lot of money. It was more than he paid for his master's degree. So why number theory? 
Well, let's first of all sort of tell you what number theory is. Um, according to the OED, which is what I always use when I want a definition for something, it's a branch of mathematics that deals with the properties and relationships of numbers, especially the positive integers, because they were made by God. The rest is the work of man. He was always fascinated by numbers since he was a small child, and Dixon's history exerted a very strong influence. He published his first significant paper in number theory in 1958. And there it is. And he wanted me to tell you that that paper was cited in 2004 uh, as uh, in a quite a good paper on, uh, on partitions. And uh, they said that they made use of his idea. He had a, an original idea there that was embedded in this paper that was, that was used. Now, Richard does not regard himself to be a professional mathematician. Now, again, that boulder of salt. But uh, he considers himself to be an amateur mathematician. And here's how he defines amateur. He loves mathematics and would like to see everyone in the world like mathematics. Well, every mathematician in this audience would say exactly the same thing. So they're all amateurs. <laughs> He's amazed that people paid him to do what he would have done anyway. I, I, yeah. But he took the money. <laughs> and that made you a professional. <laughs> so Richard's sense of humor, it's been talked about a bit. Uh, and he, he did have a remarkable sense of humor. It's extremely difficult to define. Uh, so I'm going to do this with an example. This is what we do in mathematics all the time. When you can't really do anything, do an example and maybe people will get the gist. Uh, so this I received in my mail on my 70th birthday. 2 times 5 times 7. Well, that's 70. That's 3 squared plus 5 squared plus 6 squared. Sum of 3 squares. Also, these triangular numbers here. Well, those triangular numbers are, if you want to know what they are, uh, they are, they represent the numbers 10, 15, and 45. Adds up to 70. And then the text begins. <laughs> and uh, I would point out to you that I, my middle name is Cowie. It's, I, it's, it's actually, I was named after my grandfather, Hugh Cowie in the hopes that my mother would receive his fortune. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Here's the text. And you'll notice it's somewhat, there's a lot of animals. So it starts off with, dear you, hippo birdie to yous, hippo birdie to yous, hippo birdie dear cowie, hippo birdie to yous. Richard's sense of humor. <laughs> I think it sort of describes it pretty well. OK, so I'm going to talk about some of Richard's work in number theory. Uh, now, I, I, I don't want the people who are not uh, number theorists to be uh, alarmed by this. I'll, I'll, try to be, I'll try to be gentle. Uh, but you need to know something about the kind of things he was interested in to know something about the man. and. Uh, so these are some of the things that I've just selected. I have to point out that there's many other, stuff, many other things that he worked in. But this is what he did. In, in, these are some of the things that he did in number theory. Aliquot sequences, uh, strong law of small numbers. He's well known for that. And I'll explain what that is in a moment. Diophantine equations, which most of you wouldn't know if you didn't know what mathematicians. And uh, tiling problems. So let me begin with aliquot sequences. In a sense, uh, my talk on this was already given by Carl uh, a little earlier, but many of you were not here. So I hope that uh, you will uh, forgive me, Carl, for doing what you already did. Uh, so let's talk about what we, what about, let's talk about divisors. If n is an integer, a whole number, we say that an integer d is a divisor of n if n over d is an integer. For example, 3 is a divisor of 6. But 5 is not. 6 over 5 is one of those fractions. And we don't like fractions. <laughs> if d is positive, 
it is a divisor of n and d is less than n, we say that d is a proper or the old word aliquot divisor of n. And we define the function s of n, and Carl told us earlier today that he thinks that's the first function uh, to be the sum of the aliquot divisors of n. So if you look up and you take s of 6, that's the sum of all the aliquot divisors. So that's 1 plus 2 plus 3 of 6. That's all there are. You add them up and you get 6. If you do the same thing with 28, you've got the aliquot divisors there are 1, 2, 4, 7, and 14. Add them up, you get 28. And then you notice there's something like you might think of as a pattern. Is s of n, n? Not very often, but when it is, we call such an n a perfect number. Perfect numbers were talked about by Euclid. They go way back. And uh, there are 49 that are known. The most, the, 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 it's not the 49th that we know of. It's that we know 49. So the, the biggest one uh, gives you a perfect number of somewhere in excess of 44 million decimal digits. It's not small. S of 60, if you take a look at that one, and we add up all the aliquot divisors, you see that you get 108. So not all numbers are perfect. In fact, very few are. We have another interesting thing that happens. If you take 220 and work out S of 220, you get 284. Well, what's so interesting about that? Well, if you take S of 284, you get 220. Now, that's kind of weird. Uh, that's called, well, they're called amicable numbers when they do that. Sometimes they're called friendly numbers. And Carl gave us some other little things about that earlier. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the, these uh, S sub 0 of n to be n, uh, super 0 of n to be n, S super 1 of n to be S of n, and then I will define S uh, super k of n to be S of uh, S super k minus 1 of n. So this is an iterative process. Okay? So if you take a look at what we just what we talked about here, if you take S of S of 220, you will get, well, S of 284, that's what S of 220 is, and S of 284 is 220. So S squared, uh, if you like, or S super 2 of 220 is 220. Oh, that's kind of interesting. We had S of n being n, now we've got S squared of n being n for different n's. So for a given n, we say that the aliquot sequence belonging to n is this sequence of n, then s of n, then s of s of n, and then s of s of, s of n, etc. That's the sequence of. For example, the aliquot sequence for 60 is 60, and I just worked out what uh, s of 60 was, 108. Then you go, if you take s of 108, you get 172, and if you take s of 172, you get 136. And, and you begin to wonder while you're doing this, why in the hell am I doing this? <laughs> uh, okay, I, I, grown ups do this, some of them. Uh, so we continue to get this sequence and we finally get down to one. Well, you get down to one, you're finished. You can't go any further. I suppose you can say S of one is zero, but then you can't do anything more than that. So we would say here that S super 10 of 60 is 1. Now we have the Catalan-Dixon conjecture. And this was finally formulated in 1913. Uh, Catalan didn't quite get it right when he did it, but Dixon corrected it, so we'll, we'll date the conjecture to 1913. So it's uh, slightly older than Richard. And the conjecture says this, that for any n, the corresponding aliquot sequence will terminate with either some s uh, super k of n being 1, or you get a, a kind of repeat. So you get s of k plus j of n being s of, uh, sj of n. It goes, you get into a cycle at some point. And that, what that's really saying is that the entries in the aliquot sequence corresponding to any n are bounded. 
they will not get arbitrarily large. They, they will stay beyond some bound. And, but, and for all but 896 positive integers less than 100,000, the conjecture has been verified. It's also verified uh, uh, for all but five numbers less than 1,000. These are the five numbers. If you want to beat your head against the wall, I suggest that you try looking at these and, and see. The numbers in the parentheses are how far it's been done. And you could say, well, it doesn't look very far. Modern computers can go farther than that, can't they? Well, no, uh, it's, uh, the numbers get big, very big. And those very big numbers, in order to get the next one, you have to factor the preceding one. And factoring is hard, or you hope it is, because your money is going to disappear if it isn't. <laughs> so enter John Selfridge. And I couldn't talk about Richard without talking about good old John. Uh, and a couple of pictures that I have here. Uh, one was taken uh, at the uh, first CNTA meeting in Banff in 1988. And the other, I don't know what meeting that was, but uh, I, I want to, oh, I should also point out that in the picture, I have to go and face it this way in order to tell you which one. Uh, on the left, the person on the extreme right is Alf Vanderport. Alf Vanderporten was a prominent Ma uh, Australian mathematician, but I remember him best for his statement that there are no bad talks. There are good talks and there are useful talks. And Richard is a firm believer in Alf's dictum. You, if it's a talk that's not so wonderful, you see him there working away. He's, it's going to be useful. <laughs> So what about Richard and John's contr uh, contribution? In a series of papers published in the 70s and 80s, Richard and John discovered that under certain conditions, aliquot sequences can become quite long. And this convinced them that possibly the Catalan-Dixon conjecture is false. But I would have to point out to you that this is still co regarded as controversial. Uh, the problem remains open. So it's been around for over 100 years. And uh, progress has not exactly been terrific. Uh, it's hard. In connection with aliquot sequences, in 1975, uh, Richard wrote a paper on how to factor a number. And this paper became very influential with the advent of the RSA crypto system two years later. It, uh, it had a number of ideas in it, and these ideas were worked on, and uh, uh, much of what uh, uh, factoring became, uh, started off with uh, the things that were in that paper. Now I want to talk about Richard's strong law of small numbers. This is essentially two laws. The first one is he states as, there aren't enough small numbers to meet the many demands made of them. <laughs> okay. Or he quotes something else. He says, when you notice a mathematical pattern, how do you know it's for real? Take a look at this example. Number 31, 331, 3,331, and I'm not going to say the others. They're all primes. And they're primes all the way down to this one. I'm pointing at this, and I should be pointing at that. Uh, and so you begin to think, maybe, are they all primes? Well, of course not. Because if you look at the next one, it's not a prime. It's divisible by 17. Then Richard has a, a second law. When two numbers look equal, it ain't necessarily so. <laughs> well, this is, this, is, this is actually quite a profound remark. Uh, but before I do that, I have to introduce the, the my, I'm going to do an example, but I'm going to introduce the Fibonacci numbers. Uh, this, these have been talked about here a lot, but again, not all of you have been here. So if you put F0 equal to 1 and F1, uh, F0 equal to 0 and F1 equal to 1, and compute any Fn by this uh, rule that uh, the Fk, the kth one, would be the sum of the two preceding it. So uh, F, uh, if you take a look at that, you get it's, certainly the F2 is 1 because it's the sum of 0 and 1. F3 is 2 because it's the sum of 1 and 1, uh, etc. 
So that's how you produce the Fibonacci numbers. Now, there is a great deal of lore about the Fibonacci numbers. There are whole journals devoted to the Fibonacci numbers. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of them. If you are interested in them, uh, you can find them on sunflowers uh, and, 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 and pine cones. And Note that F, I, I will want, I ask you to observe one thing, that Fm is a divisor of Fn whenever m is a divisor of n. A sequence that has that property is called a divisibility sequence. So the Fibonacci numbers are, represent a divisibility sequence. So if you take a look here, you take a look at F5, and you'll notice that, well, F5 divides F10 because 5 divides 10. And all the others are the same in that way. Well, let's, is it, do we have an occurrence of the Fibonacci numbers? Well, let's let E denote Euler's constant. And most of you know Euler's constant or have been bedeviled by it in first year calculus or uh, <laughs> high school calculus. If it's just a number, and it's this number that I've written down there, and it never ends. It, it keeps going on and on. Uh, it's the least, it, now let's take a look at this. The least integer not less than e to the n minus 1 over 2, for no apparent reason. And for n equals 0, that, that, is, that number is 1. 1 is 1. Look, those look familiar. Looks like the sequence is the same as the Fibonacci sequence, which would be truly remarkable. Because, in fact, for n, 10, 11, and 12, the series continues as 91, 149, 245. Not what they should be if they're going to be Fibonacci numbers. So it ain't necessarily so. Take a look at this one, the, 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 the second example that sits on that slide. Uh, e to the pi times the square root of 163. Now, you might wonder why anyone would work that out. <laughs> but mathematics is interesting. We do weird and wonderful things. And uh, so what you see here is this number, and you've got all these nine, 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 nines there. And you say, oh, that's got to be an integer. Wrong. It's not. It's not an integer. That's a truly remarkable thing. There are other examples like this, but this gives you the idea. It ain't necessarily so, even though it looks like it is. Second law of strong numbers. Second strong law of numbers. So let's talk about Diophantine equations. Diophantine equation is an equation for which we constrain the solutions to be integers. So as, take a look at the example that I have there, the Diophantine equation. Uh, x squared minus 7y squared equals 1. And I say, I want you to solve that. I want you to get me integers that satisfy it. And what you notice is that 8 and 3 work. 8 squared is 64. And uh, 9 times 7 is uh, 63. And the difference of those two things is 1. So it has a solution. The picture over here, you will see two people that you've seen before. And the person in the middle is Andrew Bremner. And Andrew Bremner has written many papers with Richard. And here is an example of one of them. In 1993, uh, uh, Andrew and Richard and his former student, Richard Novikovsky, studied the following problem. What integers n can be represented as x plus y plus z times 1 over x plus 1 over y plus 1 over z? Now, this is a problem that only a number theorist would care about. <laughs> but nevertheless. So as an example, for n equals 62, you get the solution that is there, and they're fairly large numbers. And the question actually turns out to reduce to a problem of finding integer points on certain elliptic curves. And, uh, that was a new area in which, uh, at some point, Richard started to get into and had to learn all about the uh, delights of uh, elliptic curves. And there are many of them. Let's tie this. I'm going to tile a 4 by 5 rectangle with dominoes. Now, there are people who are interested in these kinds of questions. 
So what you see there are two different tilings, right? You see the dominoes. I actually got some dominoes, and I put them together, and I took photographs, and then I put the photographs on this slide. So now you can see these tilings. They are distinct. And a combinatorist would ask, how many are there? How many different ways can you tile a 4 by 5 rectangle with one by two dominoes. Well, if you let a sub n denote the number of different tilings of a four by n minus one rectangle with dominoes, it turns out that you get a sub k being a sub k minus one plus five a sub k minus two plus a sub k minus three minus a sub k minus four. Kind of like the Fibonacci numbers with a kick because you get, you, now you have to use the four preceding numbers, not just two and you've got some coefficients in front of them uh, that, that are not ones. And if you actually work these things out, you, here are some of the things. So the, the answer to the question uh, of the tiling of a four by five uh, rectangle would be 95 different ways. Now, when Richard was looking at this sequence, it appeared to him that these numbers form a divisibility sequence. Take a look and just write down some of them, and this is what Richard does. He, he will sit down and he will just compute and compute and compute. I've seen him do it many times, just as you have, eh? sitting there in the meeting, a meeting is boring as hell, and he's sitting there doing something useful. <laughs> yeah, I've been in a lot of academic meetings. I know. Uh, and, uh, but what you see here is you say, take uh, A6, uh, which is 95, and you will see that it divides A12. These are, this seem to him to be a divisibility sequence. So he brought this to me, and he knew I was interested in questions like this, and uh, it's led to a, a collaboration that's been very fruitful, and we have written several papers on questions like this in the last few years. Well, that's just some of the stuff that he has been working on. But I want to talk about, although it's already been alluded to, the Richard and Louise Guy lecture series. The lecture series was a gift uh, from Louise to Richard on his 90th birthday. It uh, celebrates the joy of discovery and wonder in mathematics for everyone. So the talks are characterized by, um, I would say, fun. They're fun talks. You. Uh, it's, there's a sort of recreational aspect to the, the mathematics. It's, you don't have to worry about too many uh, schemes and, and, and uh, stacks and such. <laughs> and you can see that there's a list there of some very prominent people uh, who have given these uh, talks, at least one of, which is, one of whom is in this room. Now, I want to talk a bit about Louise. I haven't said very much about her, but I, I do want to say something. She was a great assistant to Richard in his career. And to quote Richard, Louise has been an enormous help to mathematicians and to a large number of mathematicians. Certainly when uh, she was in Singapore, uh, she became kind of den mother to uh, lots of the mathematicians who were coming out there and helping them to get established. Uh, I know that when I came out here, in uh, 2000, and when did I come out here? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, when I came out here, uh, we were immediately invited to the guys' uh, home, um, which I'm sure many of you here have visited, and uh, we were introduced there to uh, Anne and uh, Robert Elliot, uh, and we became fast friends with them as a result of that meeting. She was not a mathematician, but she knew a fair amount about mathematics. She actually tri translated Zykov's book on graph theory from the Russian and actually understood what she was translating. Uh, and judging by some books that I have read translating from the Russian, that was actually a singular achievement. <laughs> she had to learn Russian to do it. And she, most importantly, she understood mathematicians. And that's not an easy thing to do. 
Mathematicians are weird. And as a mathematician, I can say that. The doctoral degree. Finally, Richard got his doctorate. In 1991, he was awarded, a, awarded an honorary LLD by the University of Calgary. Richard's comment was, the university got a bit embarrassed, I think. <laughs> Here they had uh, this distinguished person, and he didn't have a doctoral degree, so he felt that uh, they should uh, do something, or at least that was his uh, way of looking at it. However, I would point out, to be fair to the university, and I want to be fair to the university, that... Here's what the university said about this. No person better exemplifies the prof professorial paradigm than Richard Guy. As a teacher, he has attained the ideal by inspiring the curiosity of students while explaining complex topics with simplicity and clarity. To the credit of the university, his extensive research efforts and prolific writings in the field of number theory and combinatorics have added much to the underpinnings of game theory and its extensive application to many forms of human activity. His leadership in the area of recreational mathematics has done much to demonstrate that it's possible for mathematics to be amusing as well as worthwhile. His contributions to scholarship have continued unabated well into his retirement. Well, that didn't sound like they were embarrassed. That sounded like they were proud, and rightly so. And I thought it was fitting in having this picture of Louise in the background. I want to talk about the mountains. And again, it's been alluded to, to that, uh, he's, uh, his interest in that. And Richard and Louise shared a deep interest in the mountains, in which they devoted much of their time and energy. They maintained their active lives climbing mountains into their 90s. They joined the Alpine Club of Canada in 1970, and Richard is still an active contributor to the club's activities. They were, and Richard still remains, a participant in the annual Calgary Tower Climb for the Alberta Wilderness Association. And as Ed pointed out, he actually climbed it this year. That's over 800 steps. Um, I don't think I could do that. Uh, for more information concerning this uh, remarkable couple, I would refer you to uh, this uh, website, this URL. Actually, you just have to go to the Alpine Club of Canada and you'll find it uh, somehow or other. But it's a... It, it's a Beautiful uh, publication. Uh, it's entitled uh, Young at Heart, and it is just a fabulous uh, collection of uh, uh, remarks and, uh, about Richard and Louise. The guy hut has been referred to, so I thought I would show you a picture of it. Now, I think that, Richard, you started the ball rolling by an initial... Uh, um, contribution toward this, and then more money actually started to come in. I think you, uh, uh, you did this to honor Louise, and uh, there it is, in the Watta Ice Field in the Kootenays. Uh, I've got to tell you, I don't find it very welcoming, <laughs> but, uh, but I suppose if you're stuck there, it, it makes, it, it, it's very, very welcoming indeed. If, uh, you know, I mean, gee, look at all that snow and ice. Uh, like a, an Ottawa winter. <laughs> and he's still climbing. Well, sort of. The picture, again, I have to go over here. The picture on the left shows Richard at the summit of Hauling Peak. I think this is the last time you climbed uh, a mountain. And uh, that was in 2012. And uh, you uh, took Louise's ashes up there. And it was pretty rigorous. But you made it, and you made it back. The picture on the, on the, on the right is Richard climbing the tower. And there you see him, as he usually does when he's climbing the tower these days, he has a picture of Louise with him. I'll leave the last word, in a sense, to Richard. I count myself as the luckiest person in the world. I was married to the best wife in the world for 70 years, and I was paid to do it for, for doing what I like doing. And I thought the picture of the dancing was appropriate. Thank you very much for your
That's all right. Thank you, Hugh, for a very inspiring talk. This uh, talk was, is being streamed live, and there's an opportunity for some questions. <clears throat> we have two people with mics who are, uh, who are going to run around and try to capture the qu questions that people have so that they will show up on the, on the uh, recording that's being made of this. So you, uh, you're probably here to answer the questions. Actually, um, there is a greater expert in this topic in the audience. Yeah, well, you might have to refer. <laughs> Richard, would you like to come up? Now, if you've got a question, I'm sure we've got an answer. No, no questions. You must have told I, all the truth. I, I guess I... I I have a copy of the first release of Unsolved Problems in Number Theory. I was wondering how many of those problems have been solved since that was first written? Ah, good question. How many of the problems in uh, Unsolved Problems in Number Theory have been, how, how many have them been solved since it was first written? Not very many, actually. <laughs> there you go, not very many. But they keep being inspiring. Each edition gets thicker and thicker. It's for you. Any further yes. questions? Oh, oh, Mike. Hi, Richard. Um, I, I recall when my son first met you, he, he said, Richard Guy, are you the guy who invented sliders in the game of life? And can you tell us if that's true? Did you invent sliders in the game of life? Uh, yeah, I discovered the gliders, yeah. Yeah, the gliders. So I think many people have seen the game of Con life. It's a little Conway's game video of game. Life. Conway's know. game of life, that's right. Not many of you may know it, but it's a, it's a very popular sort of game, uh, being an example of a... Hold the um, mic up closer to your... Hmm? Hold the mic up closer to your mouth. Um, yes, the um, Conway's Game of Life. Um, you, you, you start with a uh, square array of cells, uh, some of which are alive and some of which are dead and uh, the next generation uh, a cell which was dead but uh, was adjacent to just three other cells which were alive becomes alive and uh, a, a soul, but cell which was alive but which is adjacent to um, uh, as, as, as few as uh, one or as many as uh, four, I think it was, uh, three or four, um, dies. And um, uh, I happened to be in Cambridge at the time when uh, John Conway was investigating these, uh, these kinds of machine and um, we were all uh, with a bit of graph paper and, uh, and, and pushing uh, cowrie shells and uh, <laughs> go stones and things around. And I just happened to be the, the person who analyzed the, uh, the R pentomino, as it's called, 
and uh, after a few generations, uh, I found this, this chunk of uh, five cells which were uh, repeating themselves every, every four generations. And this led to the glider. And um, of course, this meant that uh, Conway was able to prove that his uh, game of life was, in fact, a, a universal machine, uh, assisted later by um, uh, oh, names keep escaping me at my age, but uh, uh, Bill, Go my Bill, age too. <laughs> Bill Gosper, who discovered the um, uh, the gliding machine. That is a, a device which would produce gliders at regular intervals, and so you were able to use this to to um, show that the the game of life was in fact a, a universal machine, and you can solve well, any any problem that you can solve on a Turing machine. You can also solve with the game of life. I'm sure that cheers you all up. <laughs> There's, yeah. Gordon. What uh, um, unsolved problem was the most frustrating in your life, and which one did you eventually conquer? <laughs> That's rather a hard one. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think I'd. One of, of course, there are many, many problems that I'd like to know the answer to, but I think the the one about aliquot sequences is the uh, is one of the ones I'd like most to know the answer. Unfortunately. Uh, uh, well, you've heard um, Hugh talk about them a little bit, and some of you may have heard Carl Pomerantz earlier talking about them. And um, uh, the uh, the trouble is that um, uh, any actual experiments are, are really not not very useful. Because, um, well, for from the technical purposes, you can't really see what's happening in an aliquot sequence until you know roughly how many prime numbers are in the factorization. And you don't know that until the log of the log of n uh, becomes a reasonable size. And... Uh, you are, by this time, you're getting rather beyond the reach of computers. So that, that, that's that one. Uh, the, what was the other half of the problem? Is this? The, the problem that you're most pleased about conquering in your life. Have I conquered any? <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm interested in unsolved problems. And give me a problem and I'll unsolve it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you find you were more productive in the office or while you were hiking? Um, I think I'd do my best work when I'm asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I often, often wake up in the morning with a slight, slightly more insight into a problem than I had before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Somebody at the very back, Mark.
Maybe not. <laughs> so I'm wondering, after a hundred years, there's a lot of memories to look back on. Is there any one memory you would single out as being the most memorable, the most, the thing you enjoyed most Is in your 100 years? Sorry. <laughs> so, what, what would be the most memorable thing that you enjoyed most? Well, <laughs> <laughs> You're not allowed to talk about that. <laughs> I'm not touching this. <laughs> pictures of the mountains, what was your favorite mountain and did you climb mountains elsewhere in the world? Well, we climbed, uh, we climbed Mount Kinabalu and I uh, climbed one or two mountains in Switzerland and of course the uh, most memorable of all was uh, 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 before Louise and I were engaged we climbed almost all the peaks in the English Lake District. Um, uh, here in Canada, uh, well, I was very proud to be on the top of the towers in the Cinnabon Park on my 90th birthday. And um, uh, I think... <laughs> Also, another favorite is Harling, which uh, I think Hugh mentioned. Uh, I took Louise's ashes up onto the top of Harling when I was 95, and that's about the last mountain I climbed, really. That's probably it. I think so. Thank you, Richard. Th thank you, everyone, for coming. There's a reception to follow in the Eel building. Is that correct? Uh, and it will begin when we get there, I guess, is the, is the, is the answer. So uh, if you don't know where the Eel building is, follow the herd. Uh, I'm sure that there will be people who are taking the lead. You did well. Thank you again, Hugh. And Richard. <laughs>